Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you so much uh, for coming today. My name is Wendy Schiller. I'm the director of the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy, housed in the Watson Institute. We're very fortunate today uh, to have a terrific, uh, uh, I would say, reporter slash television commentator host. Uh, experienced, experienced political observer in Jonathan Lamar. And uh, a, 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 I don't know if I would say equally experienced political observer, but somebody who has had a lot of political experience as well, Mark Dunkelman, who's a fellow at the Watson Institute. So I'm going to read my formal uh, introduction for them. Then we'll play a short clip. Uh, then they'll have a conversation, a moderated debate for a couple of minutes, probably 35 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, okay, I'll start with our guest. Uh, Jonathan Lamar is the host of Way Too Early on MSNBC and a political analyst for both that network and NBC News. He's also the new White House bureau chief for Politico. His book, The Big Lie, which you can purchase outside if you have not already purchased a copy, uh, Election Chaos, Political Opportunism, and the State of American Politics After 2020 was published by Flatiron Books in the fall of 2022, so just recently out. Prior to joining Politico, he was a White House reporter for the Associated Press. For the AP, he covered two presidential administrations, first Donald Trump and now Joe Biden. He broke scores of news stories and wrote authoritative analysis pieces while covering the day-to-day -day workings of both presidencies, as well as the 2020 campaign, the nation's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and the insurrection of January 6, 2021. He interviewed President Trump in the Oval Office, traveled with the presidents to the Middle East, Asia, and Europe, and received attention for his news conference questions to Trump and uh, Russia's Vladimir Putin at their July 2018 Helsinki summit. We'll be playing a little bit of that clip for you shortly. Uh, Mark J. Dunkelman is a fellow in international and public affairs at the Watson Institute. His work at Brown focuses on the architecture of the American community and the progressive movement's evolving view of power. In 2014, W.W. Norton published his first book, The Vanishing Neighbor, The Transformation of American Community. During more than a dozen years working in Washington, Dunkelman served as a senior fellow at the Clinton Foundation on the staff of the Senate Judiciary Committee, as legislative director and chief of staff to a member of the House of Representatives, and as the vice president for strategy and communications at the Democratic Leadership Council. His work has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, Harvard Business Review, Chronicle of Higher Education, Daily Beast, and National Affairs, among other publications. So without further ado, I think we'll start, we're going to lower that screen and start the clip. Should, should we, maybe we'll just talk briefly and then... Sure. Yeah. Okay, Sam. Yeah. We're going to lower the screen, yeah. but we're going to wait on playing the clip. <laughs> That's fine. So... Uh, and we want to talk as close into the mic as we can. Yeah. So I want to uh, open the open this event. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, John, welcome. To Providence. Thank you. Yeah, glad Th glad to be here. So thank, thanks th so much for coming out. Yeah, thank you for coming. And uh, John and I, I should I should admit to the crowd that John and I are old friends from college. So um, it's a it's a, a particular treat to be able to interview him. So I want to start with a hard hitting sort of Tim Russert like question, mm -hmm. which is, um, what is your book about? Oh, ah. <laughs> well the. In the mornings, I tend to get questions that go on for a few minutes before I'm allowed to uh, <laughs> respond. Um, the uh, My book is tells the story of Donald Trump, but through a particular prism, uh, and that is the big lie, his false claims of election fraud in the 2020 election. And it traces the origin of that lie. And I was there uh, in August of 2016 when he had an otherwise unremarkable rally uh, in Columbus, Ohio. And that was the first time that he or any general election candidate, major party was the nominee, suggested that the election would not be conducted fairly. And he stayed with that that fall. We know he won that election, but the claim never went far. And the book traces over the four years of his presidency, his assault on institutions and his assault on the truth and how he hijacked the Republican Party and the conservative media to go along with it. Lies big and small to get them to go along with what he wanted. And that culminated with his lies about the 2020 election. We saw the violence of January 6th, but that, of course, does not end the story of the big lie, nor does it end the story, nor does it end the book. It's only about two thirds of the way through because we're still living with the aftershocks of the big lie right now. We, as we know, we have candidates uh, 
uh, who seek office federally and locally from the Republican Party across this country uh, who have said that they don't believe that Joe Biden was duly elected president. Uh, they have said they will not necessarily accept the results of the elections in 2022. And we know that this will have a significant impact on the next presidential race, whether or not Trump himself is on the ballot. So this is a singular moment in American history, uh, but it's not over. And the book tells that story. It tells, it doesn't attempt to go A to Z on Trump, but it tells the most important, the foundation of Trump is his, the lie and the assault on the American institutions and democracy. And it's one that is sh shaping our political present uh, and our future. So I just I want to follow up on the sort of the the concept of the big lie because early in the book you talk some about the sort of notion that is you know age old in American politics that politicians lie, um, and certainly before Trump there were questions about politicians lying, and there are you know even even to this day not non I mean the big lie takes up a big chunk of the oxygen, but but there are other. So what is it that Trump does differently? Like what what is what sort of sets this big lie apart from sort of general political Right. You're, you're certainly right. You're certainly right that politicians and local offices and certainly lots of presidents have told lies. But there's never been such a relentless assault on the truth. And I'll just answer this question in some ways to the spectrum of the media, where, of course, we're always uh, challenge authority, uh, hold those in power accountable, never just accept uh, the – institutional uh, version of events. That said, when you get a White House statement, you tend to believe more than not it's grounded in at least some degree of fact. And that changed with this president, where things would just be completely, uh, completely made up, where we as an institution had to change the way we covered him. Because you couldn't just repeat what he said verbatim. You had to supply necessary context or fact checking. We all recall in the, his first campaign, 2015, 2016, where certain cable networks would rally, would carry his rallies live, from start to finish. And not only was that to the dismay of his political opponents, who certainly didn't get that kind of coverage, uh, but it just there was no filter there, and it allowed him uh, an unfair advantage. As his presidency went on, we all had to realize that I was the AP for most for for his entire time in office. That the news alerts, you know, suddenly needed a lot more context and fact checking than we ever needed to before. Uh, you couldn't just repeat what he said verbatim. You couldn't just quote him on Twitter because people would see that and not click to read the story and you'd realize you would not, you'd be giving off a false impression of what actually was happening here. I think the media got better at it. I think as his, the 2020 campaign, no one was taking his rallies live start to finish outside of a few conservative networks. Uh, there'd be real time fact checking, sometimes even just the cable Chiron on the bottom of the screen or the news anchors would dip in and out and say, no, that's not true or that's not true. Um, so it's a relentlessness to it and a shamelessness from him where we could also – that's also separates him from other presidents where he could be called upon, call out for his lies. doesn't change. He'd either repeat them or he'd just move on to the next one. So I'm going to play a clip okay. and um, I think a lot of the folks in this room will have seen this clip uh, or have read about it in a John le Carre novel. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so that I'm going to play the clip and then if you would give us sort of some of the context because I think it, it adds a sort of layer of – uh, context to, to what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. The final question from the United States will go to Jonathan Lemire from the AP. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, question for each president. President Trump, please, you first. Um, just now, President Putin denied having anything to do with the election interference in 2016. Every U.S. intelligence agency has concluded that Russia did. What, who, my first question for you, sir, is who do you believe? My second question is, would you now, with the whole world watching, tell President Putin, would you denounce what happened in 2016, or would you warn him to never do it again? So let me just say that we have two thoughts. You have groups that are wondering why the FBI never took the server. Why haven't they taken the server? Why was the FBI told to leave the office of the Democratic National Committee? I've been wondering that. I've been asking that for months and months, and I've been tweeting it out and calling it out on social media. Where is the server? I want to know where is the server and what is the server saying? 
With that being said, all I can do is ask the question. My people came to me, Dan Coates came to me and some others, they said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this, I don't see any reason why it would be, but I really do want to see the server. Uh, but I have, uh, I have confidence in both parties. I, I really believe that this will probably go on for a while. But I don't think it can go on without finding out what happened to the server. What happened to the servers of the Pakistani gentlemen that worked on the DNC? Where are those servers? They're missing. Where are they? He goes on from there. <laughs> <laughs> so just give us a sense, like, how did you get chosen to ask that question? Did his people know that you were going to ask such a tough question? Sure. Like, what was the feeling in the room? Like, what was the aftermath of having asked the question, gotten that answer? Like, can, can, can sure. you sort of give us the, the full, the full... Uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, quite the day. Um, that culminated as the end of the European swing for then President Trump, uh, which included a stop in NATO where he threatened to blow up that alliance. So that was the opening act. Uh, and then, of course, this was the main event that we... The, there have been questions about Russia's involvement with his campaign. The dog did uh, his first two years in office. This was July of 2018, so this is before Mueller's report was out. Um, this was this was the main event. I, it was that day was electric. Uh, it was, uh, you know, people have uh, historians have said there's never been a other than perhaps some of the Reagan Gorbachev. There's never been a summit that had the attention that this one uh, certainly did. Um, the way it works is for these foreign leader summits, they're called two and twos where it's not a wide ranging news conference, like Trump would be up there and take like 15 or 20. It would be two American journalists, and in this case, two Russian journalists, although the same would be if it was another foreign leader, are called upon. And each journalist gets a question for each president. So therefore, uh, you've got a total of eight. And uh, I got called um, through a bit of a lobbying campaign. Uh, you know, the AP is, uh, we, at the time where I was, uh, were on all these trips, and we had not been called upon usually at these questions because we were tough on him. Uh, Trump and I go way back. Um, he, uh, I covered him a little bit as a New York Daily News reporter. Um, he once tried to set me up on a date, which we can get to later. Uh, and he did not like a lot of the questions I asked him when I covered his campaign. In fact, he called me a sleazebag once and threw me out of an event. Um, he, uh, and I like to think that he was wrong. Um, and he, you know, he and I, he didn't like me very much. So usually Trump himself decides who he wants to. Like aides will slip him a list, like, hey, call on these reporters. And he'll ignore that and call on a couple friendlier faces. But in this case, uh, the Russians set the ground rules for the event. Uh, and instead of the presidents, because President Putin was not going to like pick out reporters, they had their respective press secretaries do it. So Medvedev did it for Putin. And Sarah Sanders, who you just heard, uh, did it for Trump. And I had been lobbying her saying, we're due a question, we're due a question, we're due a question. And uh, Jeff Mason from Reuters got the first one. The, you know, there are two Russian questions. Uh, and then Sarah Sanders called on me. And because she had the microphone and she made the decision to call on me, Trump had to answer it. If that had been Trump's choice, I wouldn't have gotten the question. Um, you certainly don't know who, uh, you know, you'd never preview your questions in advance. So like they didn't know what was coming. From my perspective, it was obvious. This was the moment we've been waiting for for two plus years. Trump and Putin were finally side by side. The questions about Russia's election interference had hovered over his entire administration. There was nothing else to ask. Um, and uh, that was the, the construct of the question. That room was, you wouldn't think of Finland being hot, um, but it was, it was in the 70s, which isn't hot, except those countries don't have buildings built with air conditioning in mind. So it was everyone, if you go back and look at the video, everyone's pouring sweat in there. Uh, at the combination of stress and the heat. Um, I asked a question there. You saw Trump's word salad of an answer. And look, we anticipated, he, he'd been asked versions of this in the past, perhaps not as directly, and he always would punt it this way. So people sort of anticipated that he would screw up the answer. No one thought he would this badly. And there's a picture that actually ran in the New York Times the next day of, it's I'm standing up and had just finished asking the question. I'm still standing as Trump answers. And his senior staffs in the front row, it's Secretary of State Pompeo, Chief of Staff John Kelly, Huntsman, the ambassador, and they all have their head in their hands. Fiona Hill, uh, who's on the National Security Council, later told me, and this is in the book, that about halfway through Trump's answer, she's like, this is so bad, 
I'm going to fake a heart attack to get him to stop talking. <laughs> like, I will do whatever it takes to get him to stop talking. Um, he didn't stop talking, and he answered that. Uh, and then I turned to my question to Putin was, I felt like, again, this is something that had to be asked. So I took a deep breath uh, and asked him if he or the Russian government had any compromising material, any compromise on Trump or his family. We all know the rumors that have been out there. Uh, Trump, uh, Putin launched, Putin, who first of all does not break eye contact when he answers a question, which is a little bit unnerving. Uh, and uh, with the events of the last few years uh, <laughs> indicate I was a little right to be nervous. Um, he uh, gave his long-winded answer about how it would be impossible to collect intelligence on every prominent American who comes in. It would be logistically difficult. He never actually denied it. Um, after the event was over, the, the news conference was the last thing on the summit. We, they raced us to the motorcade. We jumped back on Air Force One. Uh, I was since told, reported out, it's in the book. Initially, Trump thought he did well. He got up on the plane, boasting to aides, nailed it, nailed it. Had the soccer ball that Putin had given him. Uh, and within a few minutes, though, he flipped on Fox News, expected to receive adulation. And this was a rare moment when not just the network, but the Republicans' imperial network broke with him. And whether it was Lindsey Graham or others, some of his staunchest allies were all over Fox saying, this was basically traitorous. This was treasonous, this event, how bad this was. Uh, the president's mood uh, darkened. Um, he yelled at Sarah Sanders in front of a lot of staff who related to me later, like, how could you let him ask a question? How you know he's a tough reporter? You knew he was going to probably ask me something difficult. Um, how could you let this happen? And the flight time back from Helsinki to Joint Base Andrews in Washington is about 13 or 14 hours. Trump was so angry that he wanted to get home so quickly he told the pilot to step on it. We got back in about 11. <laughs> we were like pressed up against our seats as we're flying across uh, the Atlantic. Uh, and to this day, I've never had any tea served to me by a Russian either, just to be safe. No, no polonium in my diet. Um, but that was the aftermath. And I also, I landed, and I'll just, as a final note, landed, uh, you know, because we don't have, amusingly enough, at least the press, we don't have Wi-Fi on Air Force One. Uh, the, the seats also don't lie flat. Come on. Uh, a first world problem to be sure. Uh, but we, so I had no idea what was happening. I knew it was an important moment. My heart had been racing, certainly during the question. Uh, but when we, it was when we landed 11 hours later um, that we learned what just hit the, the – we landed into a firestorm. And I had gained like 50,000 Twitter followers. And, you know, I suddenly was – there was a story written by the Daily Cause that deemed me an American hero, that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, so it's certainly really, for me professionally, it was a big moment. But more than that, it was a significant moment in his administration and one that from which he frankly never recovered. And like sort of a short, the short list of Trump moments, Helsinki is – uh, is one of them, and to this day, questions still remain about his relationship with Russia. Now, then, let me follow up on that story, because in the book, late in the book, you reveal that while you were writing the book, you approached Trump and asked for an interview, and he initially agreed to do it, which seems like a strange decision, having heard what you just said, and then later pulls out. So, so can you tell us that? Like, why... Why would he have initially agreed to do it? Like, wh what's the background there? Who do you go to? So Trump's yeah. relationship with the media is unique. Where on one hand, like every president complains about their press coverage. Uh, he does so more than anyone else. Certainly no president other than him deemed us the enemy of the people who put us at the center of what he did each and every day. Uh, many of us uh, received threats. Uh, the FBI had to be involved uh, for me at one, at one moment, threats against me and my family. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, he was desperate for the media's attention and approval. You, we know, you know, Maggie Haberman's a good example of this, uh, to me, uh, a lesser extent, but I, I, it was experienced it as well, where on one moment he'd berate you. And that wasn't our last exchange. He, you know, threw me out of other events too, including one where I tried to ask him a question in front of, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, in a summit. And we were subsequently banned, uh, from the rest of that, uh, as well. Um, but at the same time, despite those moments, like he sat down for his Oval Office interview with me after that, uh, because there were certain, he desperate for media attention and approval and certain reporters who either because of them personally or the institutions that they worked for, he was desperate to have their approval. And for me, uh, some of it was probably what I wrote, but it was also because I was in Morning Joe every day and he's obsessed with that show, uh, and hate watches it. And therefore wanted my approval. So that I also detail in the book how in the 2020 campaign, on a near daily basis in the stretch run, the then press secretary at the time, Kaylee McEnany, 
would pass notes to me, pass notes to me from Trump, either saying, hey, you know, how dare you write this? Like, you're, you know, you're, a, you are a sleazebag. This is a lie. Or the next day say, look, hey, here's this poll in Wisconsin. Look how well I'm doing. Like a combination of trying to flattery to convince me of his case, as well as just criticize me. Um, so as far as the book, I went to his people, some of his top political aides. I have not spoken to Trump since uh, he left office. And uh, they initially said, sure. Um, they said that he had one request. Would he be on the cover? Uh, <laughs> I said I couldn't guarantee that, but it would be likely. Uh, that he would be. And what was what was the working title when you sold the book? It was this. It always was this. But Trump can't <laughs> help himself. He he. I mean, I will say he has participated in most of these books. Some of them are very unflattering because he tries to make his case. But uh, as there was more attention to the book, and as the big lie, because I initially broached this to him in the spring of twenty one, as the big lie really took off that summer, as a lot of state legislatures were tightening on voting rights and so on. Uh, and then we get to the January 6th committee, starts up again, and the interview kept getting pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, and then they pulled the plug. And I was indeed, he didn't want to take my questions this time. So I, I'll let pull, continue pulling on that thread, but before I do, just because there are students in the room, I, 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 it just, just seems important to hear your story. Oh, how, I can do it how, how someone moves from you know being a, a student at a, sure. an undergrad to becoming a uh, as, as important as you are now in the oh. media world. So we left off with the Red Sox. Yeah. Um, no, so I grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts, and I went to Columbia, uh, where I met Mark. Um, and I, my career path is, is and I, the advice I'd give is just to work as much as you can. Uh, I worked at the student newspaper at Columbia for a few years. I was a sports editor and columnist. Um, and then I, I was the editor-in-chief of the summer version of the paper, which was just a weekly uh, between my junior and senior years. It was about internships. Try to get paid if you can. Um, and... Uh, I worked at the New York One, which is the local cable station in New York City. Did as much as I could. And the job market at the time was very difficult. And uh, in the only offer I had, I had an overnight, I had two offers. I had a, a job, a staff job. It was an overnight sports agate job, which meant sports statistics at the Associated Press. And it would have been working literally graveyard shift. My days off were like Tuesday and Friday. I mean, it was a, you know, it was journalism. I would have done it. It, would, it was a step in the door. But in the last minute, uh, just a few days for graduation, the New York Daily News, um, which is a much more robust paper uh, back then than it is now, uh, they came to me and said, we've got an internship. You know, would you want to do a, be a summer intro, intern at our Metro desk? Um, and that's when I had my, my first encounters with Donald Trump. And they said, we'll pay you 200 bucks a week, which in, <laughs> I didn't uh, go far in Manhattan. Um, and we'll never hire you. So I was like, well, I'll get some clips. Like, let's give it a shot. This is the best that I can do. So I did. Um, and at the end of the summer, they said, hey, we're still, we're never going to hire you. But uh, if you want to keep working for 200 bucks a week, we could use the help. And I had no alternatives. And I was like, it was either back to Massachusetts or try to make this work. And I borrowed some money and I said, I will, I will try to, to do this. I'll keep working. Um, I agreed to keep working on September 1st, 2001. So 10 days later, everything changed. And I was there. I was down at Ground Zero that day. Weeks afterwards, I worked around the clock for months. Uh, I eventually got hired at the New York Daily News. Um, and I spent a, a decade there covering uh, stories of the city, covered the fire department, the police department, uh, New York City Hall, um, just Bloomberg and then uh, Giuliani and then Bloomberg. And then the Associated Press hired me uh, to cover New York City and state politics. This was the de Blasio, uh, the race 2013 that de Blasio won or better known as the race to Anthony Weiner lost. Uh, and um, I then did some national political reporting. And it was in June of uh, 2015 when the uh, editor at the AP, the political editor in Washington, said, hey, there's this event. We think it's a total stunt. We don't believe this guy. You know, It's not worth sending someone up to DC to cover this. You're our New York guy. Can you just go and write 300 words? So I was in the lobby of Trump Tower when he came down the escalator. Uh, we wrote a lot more than 300 words. Um, and uh, I started covering the Trump campaign for the AP, the White House, on the Biden administration. While doing so, started doing appearances on MSNBC as a contributor, a regular on Morning Joe. Uh, and now in the last year, or about a year now, I've worked at Politico and had uh, the host of uh, Way to Real. So, so uh, I'm going to talk, have us talk for another five, 10 minutes, and then, sure. then open it up to questions, because I'm sure the audience is chomping to the bit. Um, uh, I want to 
ask you about the way that scenes from the book have different weights years later. Because you do, like, I think one of the things that was so remarkable about reading the book was that uh, you bring up scenes that felt like they were hugely important at the time. And that now, like, I mean, I, I can barely register like what the context was, what was going on. There's one scene where Schumer and Pelosi are in the Oval Office negotiating over a, a, a government shutdown. Um, I, I didn't, I mean, I barely, you know, I mean, I'm sort of I'm marginally involved in politics and it gets hard to remember what that was about. I feel like that's faded. There's a famous scene. I mean, I remember the image of Pelosi standing by herself opposite the the, the cabinet uh, table looking, sort of looking down at Trump, maybe gesturing at him. And again, like, I, I mean, if you, if you put a gun to my head right now, I don't, I don't think I could tell you what the context was. And yet we remember your question in Helsinki. We remember him walking down, uh, coming down the escalator. We remember these various scenes. Is like, to what degree do you think that that's us as a, and maybe it's just me, but, but uh, 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 is that us? And what degree is the, the, the amount of focus that the media puts on various elements such that sure. certain things are iconic and certain things Sure. Fake? I, mean, I think some, first of all, I think with everyone's attention spans a lot shorter now than it used to be, thanks to these things, mostly. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think that Trump himself was such an onslaught of headlines every day. Uh, someone said to me once, pretty early in his presidency, that he would do, or actually it was during his campaign, that he would do in 2016, that he would do three things by noon that would have ended Mitt Romney's political career. Like part of his success was just the sheer volume. You couldn't keep, it was a fire hose. You couldn't keep track. Uh, and I, so I think that's part of it. And that there'd be something that would be, we'd wake up in the morning like, oh my God, I can't believe he tweeted that. And by 3 p.m. we're on to five other things. Um, so I think that's part of it. It's just that the, that's part, and that was a lot. Some of that was just, who he was and how frenetic he was. And some of that was deliberate. Some of that was just like throw stuff out there. Um, but I do think there are some things that will, that will stick. I remember this was a debate that those of us who covered the presidency had while he was in office. Like what, if you had to narrow it down to a few things that would stick with him, what would they be? And Charlottesville was always near the top of the list. Uh, and that's one that Joe Biden has cited as to why he ran in 2020. Helsinki is another, the, the children in the cages at the border uh, a third, um, and, and the response to the Mueller probe and firing Comey. And then all of that though, then kind of got drowned out by the pandemic and everything that came with that, with the suggestion that he should, people should inject bleach. Um, uh, I mean, I remember I was in the White House, I, I missed that one, but I was in the White House the day when, when he got COVID and the walk that he took uh, to the helicopter to Marine One where his aides had said to him, you don't go now, you're going out on the stretcher in a couple hours. Like his condition was, was deteriorating that rapidly. Um, and then of course, everything that came with January 6th. So those are, those have, those have become the indelible images that replaced the ones that yes, Schumer and Pelosi, which, I mean, I wrote the book, I'm pretty sure it was about Syria. That's what, when she stood up and said to him that it was about Syria and they were doing Putin's bidding. Um, so, but it was just an onslaught. Like we've never, both as a populist, but as a media, never encountered before. There's also a gender dynamic. Just to to jump in, uh, you also have a, you have a couple of stories about that interaction of of Pelosi and sort of the, the build up to 2018 and how the Democrats did. And there was one point you, you where she tells him, "You don't have the votes. I know you don't have the votes in your caucus." And he says something about the Democrats, and Nancy Pelosi says, "Don't tell me how to count votes in my own caucus." Yeah. And I think she either stood up or and she was wearing a strike. She always wears striking colors, like the late Queen Elizabeth II, very smart about that. And it was this, you know, don't bully me. And part of your discussion, which is really fascinating about how the Democrats try to regroup uh, and get their mojo back by 2018, is that moment for women was a very significant moment. It was part, it was alongside the Me Too movement, but it was a very significant moment is that there's somebody in who's a woman who is standing up to this person. Uh, and it happens to be Nancy Pelosi. So I think the, Mark's point is really excellent because it points to all of our individual filters. And you're right, there's so much to filter. And how people perceive who's for and what kind of person is for Trump versus who's fighting against Trump, I think can be very much you know, explained by age, ethnicity, socially constructed race, gender. And that's something that comes out, I think, in that chapter. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, there's no question there that the Democrats were in such 
to use the cliff phrase, disarray uh, in, in after 2016. And they were really scrambling for a while. And Pelosi's the one who kind of rallied them, that she was the sort of their hero uh, for us time, that she was their answer to Trump, um, you, who kind of held down the fort, if you will, until 20, the 2020 campaign began. Uh, and even then, uh, it ended up being, you know, their, their eventual you know, answer to Trump ended up being a pretty unlikely former vice president from Delaware, who a few years prior would not have been on anyone's radar, as the book details. So let's let's just briefly, since we have you here, get some political intelligence from you about what's happening on the left, what's happening on the right, how much of it deals with this, and how much this is a distraction from important debates that are happening among Republicans and Democrats, sort of irrespective of Trump. Well, certainly the this here and the big lie and, and the idea of election um, denying elections is is a huge deal. Um, we have big lie candidates uh, up and down the ballot uh, states across the country. The gubernatorial nominees in Arizona and Pennsylvania, among them, um, we had the Republican nominee for Secretary of State in the state of Nevada suggest uh, that the Republicans who would take office in various sec as secretaries of state across the country would rally together after the election and meet and overturn 2020 uh, and put Trump in office. That can't happen. Um, but it is very much with us, and it is, and I think the January 6th committee um, did a, an excellent job over the summer and last hearing last week, um, sort of detailing how close we came to things going even worse than they did uh, and how fragile the democracy is and how this remains a real threat. That said, uh, though as much as the big lie is going to be a big part of our political conversation through at least 24 and if not beyond, Polling this week suggests that though it matters and the, the fact that we've had to ask a poll now about threats to democracy being something that's important to you. I mean, that's unheard of a few years ago, but that is now a real thing. That said, it ranks third or fourth and it's behind uh, abortion rights in the, in, in the wake of the Dobbs decision. And it's certainly behind right now as we head into the stretch run three weeks away, uh, economic issues and, um, and inflation and gas prices and things like that. So that. Uh, this is certainly does have oxygen, um, but right now it seems like more voters will go to the polls uh, on other issues. Um, and then, with but with within the circles that you talk to in Washington, the Republicans who are trying to bend your ear about what's actually happening, and we're not a MAGA party, or we are a MAGA party. Like, wh where does where is that debate? Um, and and then I guess how how is it, what is your sense of how Democrats are responding to the temptation to take on Trump, or is, do they feel like it's a distraction from them getting Biden's message out? I think that Democrats feel actually that any day where we as a country are talking about Trump is a good day for Democrats uh, because they feel that there's a lot of at least the voters that are going to decide elections. That sliver of undecided independents, you know, sort of moderate Republicans, moderate Democrats are just they, they this is their theory of the case is that they are they're just tired of Trump. They don't want to be reminded of the chaos. They they the, the, the stuff this summer about the documents in Mar-a-Lago, the January 6th committee hearings to the blatantly anti-Semitic posts this weekend. Take your pick uh, are, are, are things that the American people doesn't want to go back to. Uh, and they think that, that they're provide an alternative to that. The Republicans are in a delicate situation. There are some who are full on MAGA. That's what they want. They're full throated endorsement uh, of, of that. And that's not gonna change. There are others, many of them, who will say publicly, they maybe they won't be uh, screaming at the top of their lungs, but publicly will be with Trump, but privately, who talk to us about it. They can't wait till he's gone. They know that he's a distraction. They know he's bad, um, that he's bad for them. There are certainly some in the party to think that a, a better package Trump, and some people think that's a DeSantis or uh, Carrie Lake, that they would be a more effective uh, standard bearer going um, forward, that the Trump is too much of a distraction. But if Trump jumps in, let's just be clear about this, and as, as he's taken on water this year, his poll numbers have slipped, he might get indicted. He is without question the favorite to be their nominee in 2024. Not close. He's the guy. If he wants it, it's probably him. Do I think we are at a moment where some Republicans might challenge him. Hard to see them winning. He'll beat them. He 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 has, I think an argument can be made that he has a a ceiling of support, but he also has a floor, and that floor is going to be enough to probably get him to the Republican primaries. If not, we'll see about, you know, general election might be a different story. Uh, 
I think Democrats right now are they'll, they'll tell the Trump story, but they've also trying to get out there and talk about what they have done for the American people. They think that's and they can point to a very successful summer. Um, but the, the, the economic numbers the last couple of weeks obviously are not great for them. And it does seem like this midterms have had a couple different phases where with Republican landslide for a long time, eh, close. Then suddenly over the summer, hey, Democrats, not, not only is it not going to be a landslide, Democrats might you know, keep the Senate and maybe even flip the House. And now I think we're at a point where most people, if they're being honest in both parties, suggest that the Republicans probably will flip the House. It won't be a landslide, probably just a few seats. A stat that I recite a lot in the mornings is that they don't have to flip a single district that Joe Biden won in 2020, thanks to redistricting. They don't have to flip a single district and they can win the House. Their margin will be slim, but they'll win the House. Uh, and the Senate right now looks like a true toss-up. And whether that remains 50-50 uh, or whether one, you know, a couple of these races are all really close, but perhaps they'll all break one way, that remains to be seen. And then this will be my last question before we open it up to, 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 to the audience. Will the media, do you think, cover Trump 2024 moving forward in some manner that differs from the way he's been covered previously? Are, are there lessons learned that seem to prevail among your peers? I think that well, there were lessons learned from 20... We already saw that proof lessons were learned. Our coverage of him in 2020, much better than in 2016. As discussed, 2016, he was given you know, the stage. He was not fact-checked nearly enough. Uh, he was allowed to have unfiltered access to the airwaves and you know, Twitter, whatever it might be. Uh, I think 2020, we did a much better job. But I do think 24 presents a unique test. Are we, as a media, going to refer to him as an insurrectionist candidate? You know, Does every single story about Donald Trump have to be about how he didn't accept the results of the last election? The answer is probably yes. Uh, we will be in a very new place and, and, and attempts to, to simply say those things, which are objectively true, will be perceived as bias by those who support Trump. And we are, you know, in a moment now where we've, the most polarized we've been, uh, in generations. And, and that's a trend that started before Trump. He certainly accelerated it. Uh, it is exacerbated by. Uh, you know, the fact that everyone can just, you know, by social media, the decline of local news and everyone can exist, uh, you know, team red, team blue, they can exist among fellow travelers. Mark, you've written about this it's very importantly. Um, and, uh, and, and that feeds into what we have now, where it's just, we're two camps and we're talking past each other and not to each other. So let me leave it there. I bet you there are questions. Are there any students who have questions before I open it up to wider audience members? It may no. come to them, so yeah. I'll let okay. them. All right. Sir? Uh, Othniel, do you want to? You've got a yeah, mic there. Mic, mic there. So uh, <clears throat> Donald Trump uh, fits 15 of the 10 certified <coughs> medical criteria for being a sociopath, and I wonder why the media and the public at large continues to treat him as a rational human being. And is that going to be an issue uh, coming up? Shouldn't it be? I think that the health of any presidential candidate oh, yeah. is legitimate. I think that we, we get this question, a fair versions of this question, a, a fair one, like, why do you give him oxygen? Why do you give him time? Um, we do because, as we just noted, he is still the most powerful figure in the Republican Party. Like, he is the odds on favor to be their nominee. We, he can't be ignored. Now, to piggyback on your question a few minutes ago, we do, I think the media, or at least a lot of the media, do now choose to ignore uh, some of his just completely out there comments. We ignore his just attempts to stir trouble. I mean, this weekend was an example where it was so blatantly anti-Semitic, it had to be written about because that's dangerous. That language matters. Rhetoric matters. We know we're in a moment now where bias crimes, hate crimes against Jewish people have gone up nationally and globally. So this is something where you know, that could feed into that. Um, you know, some it, he's easier to ignore now that he's not on Twitter as well. Um, but he's still a... It's not just if he was just an ex-president, that'd be one thing, but he's not more than just ex-president. He's the current favorite to be the 2024 Republican nominee. So what he does is still newsworthy. But, you know, excuse me a second, but you're, uh, don't mean to be impolite, but you're giving a Trumpian answer to the question. The question is, he is a registered sociopath. 
well, that's the, real important implication. That's not my, I, I'm not able to make that diagnosis. I know you're not, but you know, that's the problem. It's the gold water effect. Okay, we're not going to say anything professionally anymore because, you know, we, maybe that was not the right thing to do. But, you know, the future of the world is at stake here. And the medical professionals and the psychologists, it's completely clear. I mean, tell me I'm wrong about it. I mean, I don't know that he has been diagnosed as such. I mean, well, I will. You know, I, I, he said, they say, okay, we have to have a personal interview with him to diagnose him. And, you know, that's not going to happen in that context. But, so you can't, but you can't ignore that. I'm, I'm sorry, but you can't. I think that you made an excellent point. I think it's been, uh, I appreciate it, and it's been asked and answered. We're just going to go to the gentleman in the back. Thank you very much for coming to Brown University this afternoon. Uh, just two uh, short questions. One, why did the media tolerate him making those terrible remarks about John McCain? It's my sense that he should have been floored with that comment. You know, that should have eliminated the election. Thinking about Gary, even Gary Harder, just others. And then secondly, what about the upcoming rape case? Could that rape case do him in? I, I don't know enough about, I'll take the second one first. I don't know enough about that. Certainly, um, he is in, there's no question though, we could say he's in significant legal peril right now. Um, that, uh, you know, the, uh, obviously the Department of Justice is moving ahead with the Mar-a-Lago documents case. We know that the January 6th investigation also ongoing. We know the Atlanta District, District Attorney's Office, Fulton County District Attorney's Office is moving forward with theirs. We know the New York Attorney General, so on and so on and so on. So there is a chance there that that could happen. Now, a lot of those cases are going to move slowly. Um, we're going, we are going to have, it'll be after the midterms, but they will be a significant inflection point in our nation's history when the Department of Justice decides whether or not they're going to indict a former president of the United States. And we don't know what's going to happen. And I think there are a lot of people in law enforcement and intelligence communities who are very concerned about what will happen. That also doesn't mean that will eliminate him as a potential candidate either. The difference between an indictment and a conviction. Um, as far as the McCain comment was, I mean, we covered, as the media, we covered that extensively. I think there was a sense in the press, you know, Trump had been, it had been a few months into his campaign. He was sort of outrageous. He was... Uh, ascending in the polls, but I think a lot of the political establishment thought, oh, that'll do him in. Like he said some crazy things, literally in his, in his uh, kickoff campaign speech, he said the Mexicans were rapists, like, and that didn't seem to sink him, but surely this one would, because the thought was his fellow Republicans would turn on him. How dare you say that about John McCain? That didn't happen. And in fact, Trump's numbers in the party only went up. So that was the one of the first signs, frankly, of his staying power and the grip he had uh, on the GOP. That was a telling moment. Yeah. Wait, we're going to get you a mic. Okay. Thank you. So you've said secretly the Republicans want to get rid of him. Some so do, yeah. so many times there's been off ramps for them to take and they haven't. So why? The I think it is because he is still as much as they in Washington want to get rid of him. He is still very popular with their voters, with Republican voters, voters that those Republicans who personally may not like him, they need those voters too. And if you were to stiff, we, let's talk about Liz Cheney for a second. Liz Cheney is someone who, you know, stood on, uh, chose patri patriotism over party, did what she thought was right about January 6th. Uh, she came into it with, you'd think, the electoral security of having same last name. It's a it's a Republican dy family dynasty. She lost her primary this summer by thirty plus points. She didn't just lose; she got crushed, and that's a consequence. And, and to her credit, she 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 did that. She knew that was going to happen, and she stayed with it. But that's where the Republican Party is right now. You can't, with very few exceptions, there are not many places in this country where you can openly defy Trump as a Republican and hang on to your job. So I think that is a big part of it. You're right, though, that there have been some moments where they might have been able to get away with it. The most telling was, of course, the aftermath. The most obvious was the aftermath of January 6th. And the book actually has new details and reporting about that, how there was a few weeks there where they could have, if they had done that impeachment trial differently, maybe they could have gotten a conviction. McConnell almost went there. But even after that didn't happen, he was exiled to Florida. That was the moment in January, February of 2021 where their party could have probably turned their back on him. And they chose not to. And Kevin McCarthy's trip to Mar-a-Lago just two weeks after Biden's inauguration, where he went to kiss the ring and not only just posed for a photo with Trump, but apologized to Trump, as the book details, for speaking harshly to him on January 6th. That was the moment where his exile ended. Wow. Yeah. We have a question um, in the back and then we'll get to you. Sure. 
Yeah, I'll make it quick. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but this has been bothering me since 2016, okay? I did politics since I was 20 years old. The fact that Obama got a second term and then a Trump won never added up correctly to me, okay? So in the things I've read since, we had for the 2016, we had an open system of voting. We had an open system where precincts had servers hooked up to the internet. In Florida, there were two counties that reported that their data was corrupted from the internet. That was from the FBI. And then the story died. The uh. press didn't even go and say, what the heck happened? We've tightened up on election security since, but we were wide open just like 9-11 when we didn't have any security because we had open borders, open porous borders. Why did the press drop that? Uh, I'm not aware of that story. Um, and I will just simply say that, you know, uh, there has never been, there's been studies done, every election cycle studies are done and ex investigations conducted about election security, whether there had been voter fraud. And there was not any in 2020 of any note, uh, not in 2016 or 2012 or 20, 2008 or so on. Um, I'll take the other point, though. I think that there are a lot of people who believe that Donald Trump happened exactly because Barack Obama won two terms, that it was a reaction to that, that, that a Republican, that, that Trump and someone who, uh, you know, who got his political start, frankly, uh, by espousing the racist lie of birtherism, uh, struck a chord with people who could not handle the fact that a black man had been elected president, not just once, but twice. Um, and I think that I will simply say, and, and that's not to say every Trump uh, voter had race on the mind. Some did. Um, but at the very least, it pointed to, and this is a phenomenon that I encountered night after night in 2016 while covering hundreds of these rallies, um, was you'd find people, and whether that was in Ohio or Pennsylvania or Arizona or pick your state, where they, and the, where you'd find people who would say, you know, I've never voted before, or I haven't voted in 20 years. I've never spoken to a pollster in my life. I don't even really believe in the Democrat. You know, I don't think about election day at all, but I'm going to vote for this guy. Like this guy has struck a core with me. And for some of them, it's because of reasons that, that were probably racist. For some of them, it was reasons like they wanted license to be politically correct. Um, but for some of them, he just, he struck a chord on the idea of night after night, you'd find people who would say, you know, I live in this smallish town in Ohio. Uh, I, you know, I haven't gotten a raise in 20 years. The factory closed that, you know, employed a bunch of my buddies. Uh, you know, my nephew's, you know, is hooked on opioids. I have friends who committed suicide. Like the quality, you know, life expectancy was declining. Uh, that this was, there was a sense that we're suffering while they, and the they in this case could either be the elites or immigrants, or people who weren't like us, uh, were getting, hand, were, were, were thriving, were getting help hands from, helpful hands from the government. Uh, and there was a sense that the American dream had passed these folks by. They were the first generation that couldn't promise a better future for their kids than they had. And there was, and of all people, a self-proclaimed billionaire who had a has a skyscraper on Fifth Avenue with his name on the front in gold uh, struck a chord with those voters, and that's what got him elected. Yes. You do have a, uh, we have a, a gentleman. I'm going to ask the gentleman here to give the question, and then we'll we'll get to you. Could we still have a, you, you, time. you need the mic? Yeah, yeah some time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. First of all, I listen to your show every morning, driving up here to work. I'm sorry you're up so early, but thank you. <laughs> But awesome. Um, I uh, so just two questions. I'm not. I haven't read your whole book yet. I'm looking forward to it. Would you say that Trump's campaign was run similarly to uh, Barry Goldwater, 1964? And also, is Trump using the same strategy as Jim Jones did when he? Page, I yeah, I read a lot of history, so. <laughs> I mean, I don't know thank about you. that one. Um, I, I mean, certainly he. He tra he trafficked in um, uh, language that we had not heard from a long time, right? From, from a presidential candidate, uh, and for some voters, that was part of the part of the appeal. Uh, he wouldn't be politically correct. That he would he would 
he, he struck a chord to them for that they thought in a, in a society or culture that was too safe, too guarded, too whatever, you know, fill in the word. Um, and that he gave them license sometimes to say or think the things they decided told them they can't. Um, and that goes hand in hand with the description I just gave about that forgotten voter who he found. And, and frankly, and I wanted to make one more point on that. That's part of the reason why it was less of a surprise. Those of us who covered him night after night were less surprised that he won because we knew the polls weren't always right because they weren't, they, the hardest thing in politics is to find a new voter, but the Trump campaign actually did because these people were coming out like, I got voted for, but I got voted for him. And, but they weren't, they weren't being picked up in the polls. So that's partially why. Um, but he, I mean, it, it is, it is a coalition we haven't seen since, since Goldwater. And it is one that he's certainly trying to replicate. The question now, and he's taken to the extremes, right? And I think some Republicans are nervous who that if Trump ends up being their nominee again, that he has alienated some of the sort of somewhat moderate folks who might have given him a shot in 16, maybe not in 20, but at least then. Even those people who are looking back about, well, the stock market was so much better when Donald Trump was in office. Um, I like his tax cuts. Well, you know, you can make the economic argument, but those people might also be turned off by the fact that Trump right now seems to be playing explicitly to QAnon and Oath Keepers. So he seems like he's hardening his base, but shrinking it too. Um, so we have one question in the back, and then we'll get to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Is it? I can hear you. Okay. Thank you for being here. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion. What you said about um, how if the media covers him objectively, they will be seen by a pretty significant part of the population as just lying um, is pretty scary, obviously. If there's no truth that everybody can agree on anymore, like what do we do about that? <laughs> um I mean, that is one of the fundamental challenges facing the democracy right now, right? I mean, I forget if it was alternate or alternative facts, but whatever Kellyanne Conway's phrase was, but that's a, that's a thing right now. It, and, and we are we are seeing a, the media ecosystem so divided, conservative, liberal, red or blue, it's so easy to, to, to just find people you agree with and to never interact with people you don't. Again, this is Mark's great book um, that you guys should read too. Um, and, uh, and that's problematic. And the question is like, how do we get back? Like, and this is, a, I don't have an answer to it, is when Trump exits the stage, whenever that is, 24, 28, whatever, um, what happens then? Do some of these things fade? Like we've had scary moments in American history before uh, where demagogues came to prominence and eventually faded away, institutions overcame them. Does that happen again? I don't know. Uh, because we're, we, this, is a, this is a new, uh, we're in a new place, and I'm, I, I don't have an answer for that. I actually would be curious what you think. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm asking the questions today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's your subject, it's subject matter, you know well. I can, I can jump in as a Please. teacher. Right. So just as a teacher in, in teaching intro to American politics, one of the things, um, or even to my <clears throat> colleagues and family and friends, you know, every time you have a conversation with somebody, whatever, wherever they sit on the spectrum of politics, if they cite something or quote something, ask them where they got their information from. So they'll say, they say, and my, my classic remark is, some of you see me on Live the Experiment, I said this to Joe Trillo once, who's they? And just you don't be and, you know, aggressive necessarily, just say, who's they? Who's, who's your source? And did you know this other reality? Um, not necessarily contradicting everything they're saying, but something that might give them pause. Oh, maybe you want to check out this source. And it takes more work. But I think it's, you know, it's Tocqueville, you know, Tocqueville came, you know, in the 1820s and 1830s. But one of, the, one of the things he said was the bedrock in the survival of democracy is local. And for so long, we see that as oppressive because for so long in our history, it's been oppressive. But now I think you're seeing, especially with states and, um, and progressive movements starting at states rather than at the federal government, you know, it's still true. That if you can persuade a couple of people in your community to be a little bit more reasonable, then it will spread. And it just takes a lot more work. And the question is, we just don't know if people are going to do but, work. But you certainly too often, who are they? And the answer is some Facebook post that your uncle mm -hmm. put up, you know, yep. and that's not necessarily a great uh, source of information. Um, yeah, I mean, it's also, uh, this goes hand in hand with the decline of local newspapers and stuff. I mean, like, I think the best thing to do is simply to expose yourself to as many sources as you can uh, to read um, and to be as educated as you can to hopefully convince others. But also, it's also the final on now where so many elections, it feels like our, our political conversation is so national now. It used to be all politics is local. 
It's kind of gone the other way. Um, and therefore, that's sometimes harder to break through. Can I just break in and ask you to follow up on uh, your analysis of, of the polls? Uh, you said something interesting, which was that you had a sense before 2016 that that the polls, which have to be weighted, and it, this seems to me sort of a kabuki question that the pollsters get get some data and then have to weight it, and it's a little unclear to me what how they do that, but. Do you have some sense that the methodology has improved? Do you have more confidence, less of confidence? Well, what, what, what are we looking at? Because, I mean, obviously, MSNBC and AP are covering these polls. Like, should we, should we take it, them for, it, for granted? It's, it's, an open, it, it's an open question because, yes, I mean, I was one of the few voices on the Trump plane, so I think he's going to win. Um, but also, we saw the polls. They misfired in 2016. Um, they're better at 18. Uh, they misfire again in, in, in 20. Um, and I mean, Steve Kornacki, who a lot of you folks know, um, in New England there, uh, he and I had this conversation on air today. Uh, and, and he's basically like, we don't know. Because there are certain there are certain areas where there's been problems with polling, certain states more than others. I, I think that every discussion about polls, it's not that polls, I mean, look, polls aren't going to be ignored, but they should be uh, kept in proper context, that they, they may not be as accurate as we necessarily want them to be. Is there another question? There was another one. Yeah. So looking forward, what is your outlook for uh, social media sort of content reform as well as campaign reform? Because they seem to be sort of a, a sources of fuel for our confusion today. Uh, no doubt. I think your analysis, your diagnosis is correct. Whether there'll be changes, I don't know. I mean, certainly I think there is a sense that there will be some... Uh, Congress will take up at least the social media stuff probably in the new year, but it depends who in Congress as to how that will how that will go. And I don't know what the outcome will be, but certainly there does seem to be a little more energy there, right? We've had in the last couple of years some reforms about social media cracking down on blatant misinformation, disinformation. They've gotten a little better at that, but they still got a ways to go. So I think that remains to be seen, at least for now. I mean, there's no appetite in the, from the right about campaign finance reform. Um, so I don't know that that's going to change anytime soon, not without overwhelming Democratic uh, majorities, which seem, you know, very unlikely, at least this time around. So now our, our last question before we break into a more informal setting outside where um, uh, Jonathan um, can sign some books. I hope I can make a good question. But <laughs> Pressure's on. <laughs> I, I'm 87 years old. I'm a retired Episcopal priest. When I started out in 1960, you preached a 20-minute sermon. Television came in and you now had to preach a 12-minute sermon. This has come in, and I, go, I now go to a very fine parish, and the sermon is never more than five to six minutes. What is artificial intelligence, the digital, and all those other good things causing the anxiety that people act out now? by doing politically crazy things. You said people are nervous. Now, I don't know if you used that word, but they were anxious about things, but with more like little things. I, I just think they're wondering what's happening to their society, how they're gonna relate, and how we're gonna be as human beings as all this stuff comes down and makes changes for us, whether we are ready to accept them or not, or grow into them. Do I? Sure. I mean, first of all, I think that the, the trend continues about the sermons. The next one will be a TikTok. Uh, <laughs> um, but I... My kids are ready for that sermon. <laughs> uh, this is a little bit outside of my area of expertise. Um, but certainly, you're right to identify that attention spans are so much shorter than they were. Um, and that it is that much harder to get people engaged. There's also a sense of, of just, I think, general unease. I mean, we are just, we're still in the midst of a global pandemic. Like people's lives have been really changed and, and people are off their moors. And we're seeing it play out in different ways, right? We're seeing, you know, anxiety about the, the economy. We're seeing uh, crime is, is up, um, you know, in, in a lot of places. Meaning of work has really changed. Yeah, the meaning of work has changed. Uh, we have a war in Europe. I mean, there's just a lot of things that people are anxious about. I mean, you're, you've identified that I don't, correctly. I don't know what the solution is, though. 
I strongly encourage. It's really, really well written, this book, as you might expect, but it doesn't always happen. And this is just really engaging and really well written, so I recommend it. So you can purchase it outside and then further the conversation. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Rachel.